Chapter Two of the World That Couldn't Be by Clifford D. Cimac. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. Duncan got his first shot late in the afternoon of that first day. In the middle of the morning, two hours after they had left the farm, they had flushed the scythe out of its bed in a thick ravine. But there had been no chance for a shot. Duncan saw no more than a huge black blur fade into the bush. Through the bake of an afternoon they had followed its trail, Separ tracking and Duncan bringing up the rear, scanning every piece of cover with the sun-hot rifle always held at ready. Once they had been held up for fifteen minutes, while a massive Donovan tramp tramped back and forth, screaming, trying to work up its courage for attack. But after a quarter-hour of showing off, it decided to behave itself and went off at a shuffling gallop. Duncan watched it go with a lot of thankfulness. It could soak up a lot of lead, and for all its awkwardness, it was handy with its feet once it set itself in motion. Donovan's had killed a lot of men in the twenty years since Earthmen had come to Lanyard. With the beast gone, Duncan looked around for Separ. He found it fast asleep beneath a hula shrub. He kicked the native awake with something less than gentleness, and they went on again. The bush swarmed with other animals, but they had no trouble with them. Separ, despite its initial reluctance, had worked well at the trailing. A misplaced bunch of grass, a twig bent to one side, a displaced stone, the faintest pugmark were Separ's stock in trade. It worked like a lithe, well-trained hound. This bush country was its special province. Here it was at home. With the sun dropping toward the west, they had climbed a long, steep hill, and as they neared the top of it, Duncan hissed at Separ. The native looked back over its shoulder in surprise. Duncan made notions for it to stop tracking. The native crouched, and as Duncan went past it, he saw that a look of agony was twisting its face. And in the look of agony he thought he saw as well a touch of pleading and a trace of hatred. It scared. Just like the rest of them, Duncan told himself. But what the native thought or felt had no significance. What counted was the beast ahead. Duncan went the last few yards on his belly, pushing the gun ahead of him, the binoculars bumping on his back. Swift, vicious insects ran out of the grass and swarmed over his hands and arms, and one got on his face and bit him. He made it to the hilltop, and lay there looking at the sweep of land beyond. It was more of the same, more of the blistering, dusty, slogging, more of thorn and tangled ravine and awful emptiness. He lay motionless, watching for a hint of motion, for the fitful shadow, for any wrongness in the terrain that might be the Scytha. But there was nothing. The land lay quiet under the declining sun. Far on the horizon, a herd of some sort of animals was grazing, but there was nothing else. Then he saw the motion, just a flicker on the knoll ahead, about halfway up. He laid the rifle carefully on the ground and hitched the binoculars around. He raised them to his eyes and moved them slowly back and forth. The animal was there where he had seen the motion. It was resting, looking back along the way that it had come, watching for the first sign of its trailers. Duncan tried to make out the size and shape, but it blended with the grass and the dun soil, and he could not be sure exactly what it looked like. He let the glasses down, and now that he had located it, he could distinguish its outline with the naked eye. His hand reached out and slid the rifle to him. He fitted it to his shoulder and wriggled his body for closer contact with the ground. The crosshairs centered on the faint outline of the knoll, 
and then the beast stood up. It was not as large as he had thought it might be, perhaps a little larger than earth lion size, but it was certainly no lion. It was a square-set thing, and black, and inclined to lumpiness, and it had an awkward look about it, but there were strength and ferociousness as well. Duncan tilted the muzzle of the rifle so that the crosshair centered on the massive neck. He drew in a breath and held it, and began the trigger squeeze. The rifle bucked hard against his shoulder, and the report hammered in his head, and the beast went down. It did not lurch or fall, it simply melted down and disappeared, hidden in the grass. Dead center, Duncan assured himself. He worked the mechanism, and the spent cartridge case flew out. The feeding mechanism snicked, and the fresh shell clicked as it slid into the breech. He lay for a moment, watching. And on the knoll where the thing had fallen, the grass was twitching as if the wind was blowing, only there was no wind. But despite the twitching of the grass, there was no sign of the scythe. It did not struggle up again. It stayed where it had fallen. Duncan got to his feet, dug out the bandana, and mopped his face. He heard the soft thud of the step behind him and turned his head. It was the tracker. "'It's all right, Separ he said. You can quit worrying. I got it. We can go home now. It had been a long, hard chase, longer than he had thought it might be, but it had been successful, and that was the thing that counted. For the moment the Yua crop was safe. He tucked the bandana back into his pocket, went down the slope, and started up the knoll. He reached the place where the scythe had fallen, there were three small gouts of torn, mangled fur and flesh lying on the ground, and there was nothing else. He spun around and jerked his rifle up. Every nerve was screamingly alert. He swung his head, searching for the slightest movement, for some shape or color that was not the shape or color of the bush or grass or ground. But there was nothing. The heat droned in the hush of afternoon. There was not a breath of moving air, but there was danger, a saw-toothed sense of danger close behind his neck. Sebar, he called in a tense whisper. Watch out! The native stood motionless, unheeding, its eyeballs rolling up until there was only white, while the muscles stood out along his throat like straining ropes of steel. Duncan slowly swiveled, rifle held almost at arm's length, elbows crooked a little, ready to bring the weapon into play in a fraction of a second. Nothing stirred. There was no more than emptiness, the emptiness of sun and molten sky, of grass and scraggy bush, of a brown and yellow land stretching into foreverness. Step by step, Duncan covered the hillside and finally came back to the place where the native squatted on its heels and moaned, rocking back and forth, arms locked tightly across its chest, as if it tried to cradle itself in a sort of illusory comfort. The earthman walked to the place where the scythe had fallen and picked up one by one, the bits of bleeding flesh. They had been mangled by his bullet. They were limp and had no shape. And it was queer, he thought. In all his years of hunting, over many planets, he had never known a bullet to rip out hunks of flesh. He dropped the bloody pieces back into the grass and wiped his hand on his thighs. He got up a little stiffly. He'd found no trail of blood leading through the grass, and surely the animal with a hole of that size would leave a trail. And as he stood there upon the hillside, with the bloody fingerprints still wet and glistening upon the fabric of his trousers, he felt the first cold touch of fear, as if the fingertips of fear might momentarily, almost casually, have trailed across his heart. 
He turned around and walked back to the native, reached down and shook it. Snap out of it, he ordered. He expected pleading, cowering, terror, but there was none. Sipar got swiftly to its feet and stood looking at him, and there was, he thought, an odd glitter in its eyes. Get going, Duncan said. We still have a little time. Start circling and pick up the trail. I will cover you. He glanced at the sun. An hour and a half still left, maybe as much as two. There might still be time to get this buttoned up before the fall of night. A half mile beyond the knoll, Sipar picked up the trail again, and they went ahead. But now they traveled more cautiously, for any bush, any rock, any clump of grass might conceal the wounded beast. Duncan found himself on edge and cursed himself savagely for it. He'd been in tight spots before. This was nothing new to him. There was no reason to get himself tensed up. It was a deadly business, sure, but he had faced others calmly and walked away from them. It was those frontier tales he'd heard about the Scyther, the kind of superstitious chatter that one always hears on the edge of unknown land. He gripped the rifle tighter and went on. No animal, he told himself, was unkillable. Half an hour before sunset he called a halt when they reached a brackish waterhole. The light soon would be getting bad for shooting. In the morning he'd take up the trail again, and by that time the Scytha would be at an even greater disadvantage. It would be stiff and slow and weak. It might even be dead. Duncan gathered wood and built a fire in the lee of a thorn-bush thicket. Sipar waded out with the canteens and thrust them at arm's length beneath the surface to fill them. The water still was warm and evil-tasting, but it was fairly free of scum, and a thirsty man could drink it. The sun went down and darkness fell quickly. They dragged more wood out of the thicket and piled it carefully close at hand. Duncan reached into his pocket and brought out the little bag of rockahominy. Here, he said to Sipar, supper. The native held one hand cupped, and Duncan poured a little mound into its palm. Let go, mister, Sipar said. Food giver? Huh? asked Duncan, then caught what the native meant. Dive into it, he said almost kindly. It isn't much, but it gives you strength. We'll need strength tomorrow. Food giver, eh? trying to butter him up, perhaps. In a little while, Sipar would start whining for him to knock off the hunt and head back for the farm. Although, come to think of it, he really was the food-giver to this bunch of sexless wonders. Corn, thank God, grew well on the red and stubborn soil of Lanyard. Good old corn from North America. Fed to hogs, made into corn pone for breakfast back on earth, and here on Lanyard, the staple food crop for a gang of shiftless varmints who still regarded, with some good solid skepticism and round-eyed wonder, this unorthodox idea that one should take the trouble to grow plants to eat rather than go out and scrounge for them. Corn from North America, he thought growing side by side with the Vua of Lanyard. And that was the way it went, something from one planet and something from another, and still something further from a third, and so was built up through the wide social confederacy of space, a truly cosmic culture which in the end, in another ten thousand years or so, might spell out some way of life with more sanity and understanding than was evident today. He poured a mound of rockahominy into his own hand and put the bag back into his pocket. Sipar, yes, mister. You were not scared today when the Donovan threatened to attack us. No, mister. The Donovan would not hurt me. I see. You said the Donovan was taboo to you. Could it be that you likewise are taboo to the Donovan? Yes, mister. The Donovan and I grew up together. Oh, so that's it, said Duncan. 
He put a pinch of parched and powdered corn into his mouth and took a sip of brackish water. He chewed reflectively on the resultant mash. He might go ahead, he knew, and ask why and how and where Separ and the Donovan had grown up together, but there was no point to it. This was exactly the kind of tangle that Shotwell was forever getting into. Half the time, he told himself, I'm convinced the little stinkers are doing no more than pulling our legs. What a fantastic bunch of jerks. Not men, not women, just things. And while there were never babies, there were children, although never less than eight or nine years old. And if there were no babies, where did the eight and nine-year-olds come from? I suppose, he said, that these other things that are your taboos, the stilt birds and the screamers and the like, also grew up with you. That's right, mister. Some playground that must have been, said Duncan. He went on chewing, staring out into the darkness beyond the ring of firelight. There's something in the thorn bush, mister. I didn't hear a thing. Little pattering, something is running there. Duncan listened closely. What Separ said was true. A lot of little things were running in the thicket. More than likely mice, he said. He finished his rockahominy and took an extra swig of water, gagging on it slightly. Get your rest, he told Separ. I'll wake you later so I can catch a wink or two. Mister, Separ said, I will stay with you to the end. Well, said Duncan, somewhat startled, that is decent of you. I will stay to the death, Separ promised earnestly. Don't strain yourself, said Duncan. He picked up the rifle and walked down to the waterhole. The night was quiet, and the land continued to have that empty feeling. Empty except for the fire and the waterhole, and the little mice-like animals running in the thicket. And Separ. Separ lying by the fire, curled up and sound asleep already. Naked, not with a weapon to its hand. Just a naked animal, the basic humanoid, and yet with underlying purpose that at times was baffling. Scared and shivering this morning at mere mention of the Scytha, yet never faltering on the trail. In pure funk back there on the knoll where they had lost the Scytha, but now ready to go to the death. Duncan went back to the fire and prodded Separ with his toe. The native came straight up out of sleep. "'Whose death?' asked Duncan. "'Whose death are you talking of?' "'Why, ours, of course,' said Separ, and went back to sleep. End of chapter 2